me know because sometimes it shows up. There we go. Okay, so hi, everybody. I am Kelly Pollack. I am the co-host of Two Broads Talking Politics and the host of Unsung History, and I'm going to be moderating this uh, panel that I am so excited about today. I'm so glad these wonderful people are joining me. Uh, so just to set this up for just a minute, and then I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Uh, this is part of the Zen Education Project Teach Truth Pledge Days of Action. Uh, so as I'm sure most people watching know, there are legislators in 28 states right now that are trying to pass legislation or have already passed legislation that would limit teachers' ability to teach the truth about the role of racism, sexism, heterosexism, and, and all forms of oppression throughout U.S. history. Uh, and so educators uh, throughout the summer have been signing a pledge, and we'll put a link a little bit later, uh, have been signing a pledge saying they're going to teach the truth. Uh, and this weekend of action through an Education Project is to raise awareness to, about what's going on. So I now uh, would love to have my panelists here just sort of introduce yourselves uh, and, and just say a little bit about kind of what, how this uh, particular uh, Teaching the Truth uh, action really resonates with the kind of work that you do. So uh, Yahuru, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Yahuru Williams. I am a professor of history and the founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I do work on 20th century U.S. history, um, constitutional and legal history, African-American history, and I write about the civil rights and black power movements. And for me, this conversation really pivots on something, um, and I'm glad he's part of this conversation, that Hassan Jeffrey said back in 2005, when he said, this is really, re really isn't about teaching the truth, it's about teaching hard history, challenging assumptions, and allowing us to be in a space where we really uh, reflect on and interrogate what our core democratic values mean in the context of hard history. And so for me, when I think about this moment, um, I think educators have to go into this semester uh, thinking in a very tangible way about the work that we need to do as we're at this inflection point with regard to racial justice, with regard to the existential threat to American democracy is encapsulated by the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, thinking that we're the advance guard of making sure that this conversation remains relevant to young people and allows them develop, to develop the critical thinking skills necessary to navigate these conversations. Yeah, so why don't we just sort of go around on the screen here, Sari, if you want to go next. So my name is Sari Rosenberg. I am a high school U.S. history teacher in New York City. I'm about to start my 20th year at the same school, the High School for Environmental Studies. I'm also the host of the PBS NewsHour Extra Educator Zoom series. And I, I'm so passionate about this topic because it's at the center of what I've been doing for the past two decades, teaching history, which is teaching the truth. It's integral to what we do. And I'm fortunate enough to teach in a, in a school system, a school district, and a school that is dedicated to that. Unfortunately, I have peers and colleagues across this country who don't have that privilege right now or that same safety that I have. So I see it as it's not just my job to make sure I continue to teach the truth to the young people who enter my classroom every day, every every day, every year, <laughs> not every day. Uh, but also I feel like because I have this, this a little more protection where I teach, I feel like it's my, my duty, my role as an educator to defend those and speak up for those who feel like their jobs are on the line, all because they want to teach the truth. And we have to really think about as a nation, how how that is coming under assault and why that's coming coming under assault right now today in 2021. Yeah, thanks, Siri. Hassan. Hey, good morning, uh, Hassan Kwame Jeffries, associate professor of history in the Department of History at the Ohio State University. Um, and you know, when I think about teaching truth and, and what it means, um, I, I think it is very much teaching that hard history, but teaching it honestly, right? Because you can talk about slavery. Uh, but if you don't talk about it in an honest way, meaning, you know, the ways in which African-Americans respond, the way, you know, who was actually doing the enslaving? I mean, if we don't talk honestly about those aspects of the past that make us uncomfortable in the present, um, then we are not teaching truth. Uh, and as educators, that is our primary responsibility in, in history and social studies and civics and government. 
Uh, we have a responsibility to be honest. We have a responsibility to teach truth because otherwise, e even even if we leave out those core things, um, those, those, those elements of truth, uh, then we are miseducating uh, and we can't uh, continue to miseducate. I mean, that's the history of American education, right? Is miseducation, is indoctrination. <laughs> you hear that, the I word being tossed around a lot. We could talk about indoctrination, but it ain't what's going on now. Uh, and so at the core of, of dealing with this is this notion of teaching truth. And, 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 and we have the truth on our side, right? I mean, those who wanna talk about um, those difficult aspects of our past uh, in frank and honest ways, um, you know, can do it uh, because we're not making stuff up. Right. I mean, we have the facts on our side, not the fictions that people want us to uh, continue to perpetuate. Yeah, thank you. And Candace. Uh, I'm Candace Cunningham. I'm an assistant professor at Florida Atlantic University, um, where I work on African-American history, uh, women and gender studies, public history and digital history. And um, my research is on African-American school teachers, uh, particular teachers in the 20th century who were uh, in the civil rights movement. And so when I think about what's happening now, I of course think about it historically. Um, and one of the things that really resonates for me is that teaching and public education in particular um, has always been politicized in this country. Uh, teachers work has always been politicized. Um, the work of educating people and particularly educating underprivileged children um, has always been politicized. And I think it's a reminder that our public education system um, was really never created to give everyone equal education. Um, there were always these disparities that existed. Um, and so we need to think about what's happening now from a historical perspective and, and link it to the past in order to really understand the present. Yeah, thank you. And so I, I'll just respond briefly to this as well. Uh, I sort of wear three hats in coming to this conversation. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I'm the co-host of Two Broads Talking Politics, uh, which is a podcast that's been running since 2017. And uh, our focus is really on action, sort of what, what actions can people take? What can we do? I, I think there's a lot of podcasts which, you know, have, have, have a great success talking about politics, uh, which we also do. But, but I always want to know, okay, what can I do? How can I change this? Uh, and so that's um, that's certainly one of the the perspectives that I bring to this. Uh, and anyone who's been in a work meeting knows that I end everything with, okay, action items, what do we do? What's next? Uh, so we will end this conversation that way as well. Um, and I recently, about a little over two months ago, started a, a second podcast, uh, which is called Unsung History. And this is how I met Candace, uh, actually. So on Unsung History, I'm really interested in uh, sort of doing a deep dive each episode into issues in history topics, people that uh, that just don't get as much notice. Um, and, you know, when I first started thinking about that, it was just, a, oh, these are things that people just don't think about. Uh, and I quickly came to realize that for some of these topics, these are things that aren't just forgotten, they're actively suppressed. Uh, there are reasons we don't hear these stories. Um, and that's certainly true the episode that Candace was on with me uh, that we talked about those black teachers in the civil rights movement. Uh, and so it's that is something that has become increasingly important to me uh, over the past couple months as I've thought more and more about that. Uh, and I, I'm so glad that the teachers and it's an education project are, are fighting back. Uh, and then the third hat I'll mention is that I am a mother of elementary school aged kids uh, who go to school in a majority black school on the south side of Chicago. And so this is a really important thing uh, in, in their lives, learning about, uh, you know, Black history, things that affect their classmates. And I want to make sure that the education they are getting in elementary school and the kids all over the country are getting uh, is, is full of truth uh, and, and uh, these hard histories that Hassan was talking about. Uh, so I want to talk, uh, you know, and, and this this may or may not be sort of a <laughs> complicated conversation, but sort of what what it is that this legislation all over the country is is really trying to do. So uh, you know, some of these bills are sort of really vague. Uh, the, it's not entirely clear what uh, how you would even know if you were breaking the law or not. Uh, so, I, and I'm not sure maybe who wants to tackle this first, but, um, you know, sort of what, what is critical race theory and 
you know, how is that not what's actually happening in elementary schools? Uh, and what are what are these laws uh, either on the face of it trying to do or what do we think they might really be trying to do? Uh, so we don't have to sort of go in order, but whoever wants to maybe tackle one or uh, both of those questions. I'll start calling on you if nobody volunteers. <laughs> Uh, Candace, we we talked a little bit about this in uh, in the episode you did with me of unsung history. Uh, so, and you were just talking some about this, but um, but maybe you could sort of tie that that idea of um, uh, of teaching uh, black teachers teaching teaching black students always having been political. Um, so maybe if we want to start there. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges um, that teachers are having, particularly with some of these um, pieces of legislation that are quite vague, is you know it's not as if the concepts of critical race theory only emerged once we had critical race theory, right? I mean, the idea that race can be a determining factor in someone's life outcome is an old one, um, right? Easily dating back at least to Reconstruction. Um, with, you know, um, historians like W.B. Du Bois. So I, I think that's part of what, what the confusion is. But I also think that things today are a little bit more complicated, uh, are much more complicated in many ways than they were then uh, when we talk about uh, segregated schools. Um, because you're oftentimes, particularly for African-Americans, talking about schools that were um, Black students, Black teachers, in black communities, right? And so you're talking about teachers and communities that are quite uh, invested in what was happening um, and teachers that had quite a bit of support. I think if there is a, is a, one, a lesson um, that, that we can take from that is that this is not a fight that teachers can have on their own. Um, this is not a fight that teachers can win on their own. Um, and, you know, another important lesson, I think, is, you know, I researched teachers from World War I to the 1970s and every single teacher in every single case study. And this is really kind of scary, right? Every single one of those teachers lost their jobs, all of them. There are no exceptions. Um, and so this, this is not a fight that teachers can win on their own and they really need um, our support uh, as, as part of the larger community. You know, I really appreciate where Candace is coming from, because even for those of us who don't do work directly on teachers, and I know this is true of Hassan's work and mine as well, working on a project on lynching and capital punishment in Delaware now, and one of the proponents of an anti-lynching bill was Alice Dunbar Nelson, who lost her job at Howard High School because of her activism. So this is a, a theme in African-American history, particularly when teachers are at the forefront of those struggles and are trying to navigate different spaces where they're not just teachers. They're also um, in this privileged position of trying to advocate for justice and equity in the community as a whole. In terms of the question of critical race theory, uh, the problem in this moment is that this is a lens of analysis that really emerged in law schools um, in the late 1980s. And it's really associated with the pioneering work of Derrick Bell. Uh, the person who's probably most associated with critical race theory as a lens of analysis is Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who talked about, among other things, the importance of race as a lens of analysis and understanding how to really be able to appreciate uh, challenges in the law and the failure of the law to address issues of equity and justice, one really has to understand the history of race in America. So we can't talk about housing inequality without understanding how race has been central to that. We can't talk about disparities in cr criminal justice without understanding the importance of race and how race is central to those conversations. In our contemporary moment, um, and I want to be very clear about this, no K-12 curriculum in the United States mandates critical race theory. Um, it is not something that uh, teachers are doing professional development on, but as uh, Candace pointed out, as a lens of analysis, it's certainly something that uh, many teachers use to help explain a range of issues. Uh, Hassan, I know, has done exceptional work with teachers around this area, looking at the importance of teaching race so that students understand the complexity of American democracy in the 20th century and being able to connect that in a, in a very tangible way. What led to our contemporary challenge is really related to um, three things, and they're political, and I'll try to do this very quickly. One was the election of President Donald Trump. Um, the continuing lingering impacts of the culture war in America and the publication of the 1619 Project, which was this triggering um, force moment where 
a large part of the population was forced to deal with the hard history that we talk about and teach about, but they've never been confronted with in a way that the mainstream was saying, here it is, you've got to deal with this. And it's become a mechanism by which those who are uh, concerned, and they frame it as concerned, but really um, worried about the loss of privilege that comes along with a loss of political influence, that comes with the cha changing demographics of America, that comes with the loss of influence in this moment of reckoning with racial justice, particularly in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, in our kind of polarized politics are looking for something to say, this is the culprit, this is the thing that led us to this, this moment of rupture. And the reality is nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, the reality is that this is the healthy part of an evolution of a conversation about American democracy and why we have not lived up to the aspirational language we find in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution. And the reason that aspirational language has never reached its zenith is because we haven't dealt in a tangible way with issues of racial inequality, gender inequality, economic inequality that really haunt the American enterprise. And I would just add and trying to make sense of sort of the moment that we find ourselves in, because I think it is important to understand sort of the politics of this. Uh, because if, 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 if we agree, it, and you was right, hey, ain't nobody teaching this, right? There's no mandated classes on critical race theory K-12, then what's the hysteria about? And, and, and that's where we have to really understand the moment because we can track it back absolutely to the election of Barack Obama, the election of Donald Trump. But then also, I think two things that are critically important that, that we see play out in this. One is the reaction to the murder of George Floyd. I mean, some 30 million people taken to the streets in June and July of 2020, not only demanding uh, justice for the victims of police violence, but uh, also calling for an end to systemic racism. And that's the key, right? And we go back to the Black Power era, people are calling for, look, we got to deal with, you know, uh, institutions and structures that promote uh, white supremacy. But now we haven't seen that embrace in sort of a public way. That scared the hell out of some white folk, right? Especially elected officials. And they're like, man, what are we going to do with this? And so not only the, the calls for it, but as an example, here in Ohio, the State Board of Education in June of 2020, said, we got to deal with systemic racism. They should you know, put forth a resolution, just a resolution, right? And they didn't say, how they were going to do it? They were just saying, look, we know it's a problem, right? Here in Ohio, you know, these values, you know, conservatives were like, oh my God, right? So now before they are coming for your guns and then your Bible, now they're coming for our children. And so that had been simmering, that had been simmering. And then we get into September uh, and, you know, you have this 1776 nonsense that, that, that Trump uh, put forward. And if you look at all the legislation, all it does is parrot what was in that executive order, right? But we also have to uh, realize, and this is where the, so you have people on the ground who are like, we're upset about this, right? We don't wanna deal with the systemic racism thing. What do we do? But then Trump loses. See, when he loses, that's critical too, because now you have you know, political conservatives, elected officials, politicals are like, man, we are gonna lose all the white supremacists who were animated by Donald Trump's racism. So what can we do to keep them engaged? And that's when we see all of these bills. I mean, connect that to the voter suppression laws that go on. But then it's this culture aspect that coming for your children, they're coming for your children, they're coming for your children. And that's when we see that spate of bills. It's all designed to animate that, that, that base that was animated by Trump's white supremacy. Now, it would be one thing if it was just left in the realm of politics and we can deal with it in that political sphere. But then why, the question then becomes, well, why is it picked up? Right. By parents who, who start calling teachers in school to say, hey, you know, we're not animated by Trump's white supremacy, but what's going on here? And that's where the, the seeds of confusion get sown. Now, I think you was right there. You know, you have a lot of white parents because they ain't black parents who are calling. Right. You have a lot of white parents who are worried about the loss of their privilege. Right. Now, they're not going to frame it as that. But when we create this sort of zero sum game, then they get all worried and concerned. And so that's the political environment. And so this is a this is a manufactured political crisis. And I, we'll, I know Kelly will talk about some, what can we do uh, you know, in response, but it has to be a political response as well, mobilizing and grassroots organizing. And just to add to that, there was a piece that just came out in the nation this week that sure enough, the Koch brothers network was behind all of this, right? We all knew that, well, we would all guess that, but this is a, as, as you were just saying, a coordinated attempt to galvanize white parents, let's be honest who it is.
Yeah. So, Sarah, I wonder if you could talk some about your experiences actually teaching this stuff in classrooms and, you know, uh, whatever it is that white parents are afraid of and, you know, loss of privilege is, is certainly there. How do students actually respond in the classroom? You know, what what is it like to teach them these things and, and what are they getting out of that experience? So, Full disclosure, I teach primarily BIPOC population. I'm here in New York City. The first reaction though, I teach mostly juniors in high school. Their first reaction when they learn about things they never learned about in middle school, unfortunately, or at least they forgot learning about, I'll give their teachers the benefit of the doubt. They say they're angry, they're angry. And not just the uh, BIPOC students, all the students are angry when they learn about what really happened during and after Reconstruction, when they learn about the experience of enslaved people, the true lived experience, ex experiences, when they learn about, when, when we take a real deep dive into the civil rights movement and every single time they say, hey, wow, I'm, I'm so, oh, did I freeze? You're fine. <laughs> oh, that's weird. I froze for a second. But yeah, they freeze. <laughs> they all freeze up. And no, I'm just kidding. No, they get really, really angry that they haven't learned about this before, but they get excited and they feel seen and they feel like, wow, we're a part of the American story too. We're not just victims in this story. We we were activated. We we fought for our rights. We, you know, we were left behind because of structural forces. We're not going crazy when we feel as though they're, 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 we're not being represented in the way that our, our white, the other white citizens in this country, our white people, white folk in this country. So to me, and, and also even the white students in my class, they don't feel uncomfortable. You, you hear a lot of that coded language. It's not that they feel uncomfortable, it's that their white privilege is being questioned and that makes them uncomfortable. I've, I don't I don't think I've spoken to one white student who walks out of a class learning about the truth about America. I don't hear them walking out feeling uh, uncomfortable or unsafe. I feel them, I, they're activated to make America a better place. Young people, the final thing I'll say is young people under can, can handle the complexity of the American story. We don't have to protect them so much. In fact, you're doing them a disservice when you, when you, when you don't teach them the complexity of American history. They're going into Dr. Cunningham's class, Dr. Williams' class, Dr. Jeffrey's class and saying, wait, why didn't I learn about this? I could have handled this in middle school or even elementary school, right? Or even kindergarten. They can handle it. We're, 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 we're selling our young people short when we don't teach them the truth. You know, and, and I, I, would, I would just add that the, part of the fear, right, goes back sorry, to the point that you made that when we do talk about the truth, when we do teach the truth, and, and my students at Ohio State, Lord, it, it, they, they're almost all white, right? And Ohio State is very white. The big school is very white. I got a lot of white kids. Um, but what happens when you start teaching the truth, then they do get activated, right? But that's part of the fear. Because what are they saying after class? Man, we got to do something about this, right? This isn't right. That scares the hell out of their white parents, right? Because what? And, and why? Because they're saying we have to demand change. That's why 2020 was so unique and so remarkable and so different because you did have a lot of white people out there, right? Now, some of them, you know, they went to brunch after the march, but you have a lot of white folk, you know, and, and white kids who are like, no, 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 we got to do something about this. And I think that is part of what this fear is. So let's not, if, if, if talking and teaching about it is going to get, is going to trigger something in their minds to say, you know what, we can do better than this, then let's not do that because that's challenging the status quo. And, and there are a lot of people who are invested in maintaining the status quo. I want to add to that just very quickly because it's a, when Hassan makes that point about last summer and that moment where when Al Sharpton gives that memorable eulogy for George Floyd and says, George Floyd's story has been a story of black folk in America, but then comments on the fact that there are, in, in his words at that time, more whites out in the street demonstrating. As Hassan points out, and this is very critical to understanding the difference between today and the 1960s, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, white allies came to help black people in the South. Today, the conversation is about dismantling systems of oppression, and that is very unsettling to the vast majority of Americans who are recognizing in that, white Americans, a loss of privilege that is real. And it begins in a lot of ways with the curriculum. Now, I want to emphasize what um, Candace said earlier, and it ties to Siri's comment about 
the challenges in the way that young people look at history classes, because they're not taught history in K-12. We teach social studies. We don't call it that, but social studies and civics are in history. They are what Thurgood Marshall argued in 1958. Education is not the teaching of the three R's. It's about the teaching of overall citizenship. And citizenship or instruction in that is really about simple um, civic values that are imparted through a curriculum that was sanitized, whitewashed, and ultimately supported white supremacy in ways that now people are saying, tear that up. We want to learn about the women that Candace writes about. We want to talk about the complexity of race. We want to look at intersectionality. We want to understand um, what it means to be allies and what it means to kind of push the American enterprise to, this, to the place where we can actually live up and actualize those values that we talk about. I understand completely in that context why people come, in, and this is very important to this conversation as well, come to the Capitol on January 6th bearing Confederate flags and nooses. Um, it's not because they don't understand that history, it's because they understand that history very well. And I just wanted to chime in, you know, we have been focusing right, rightfully so on uh, K through 12 education, um, but as someone who is teaching at a state university and a conservative state, um, these are also concerns about, there are some legitimate concerns about this, um, you know, possibly interrupting college education and um, sort of academic freedom in the, in the college classroom, um, which has traditionally been a space where students can learn the truth and can, and can um, sort of have some of their, uh, some of the ideas perhaps that they uh, thought were correct, challenged. Um, and, you know, as someone who teaches in a college classroom, I, you know, I just want to remind people that, you know, these students might be young, but they have their own minds. Um, they are very capable of coming to their own conclusions. Um, and, and they are capable of merging um, truthful ideas about the American past and present with their political beliefs. Uh, you know, I think there's this idea that college professors are indoctrinating students. I think people would be shocked to find out how many college professors are actually incredibly conservative. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you're teaching people the truth, of course, there is going to be this sense of shock because it's the exact opposite of what they've literally been taught their whole life. Um, but, yeah, this this is a concern that's going to, I think, be beyond uh, K through 12 education. It's something to kind of keep in mind throughout this conversation. Yeah, that's a really important point, Candace. Thank you. So I, I wonder, too, if we could talk sort of about uh, approaches to this, you know, so uh, all of you are in classrooms talking to students, uh, writing and researching, you know, what, what are the sort of ways to get at this with students, you know, and maybe that means uh, the the stories in history that are really going to resonate with them. Maybe that means the kind of language that you might use to talk about it or how you set it up so that it's obvious it's a structural problem and not just this one event that happened. So I wonder if you could talk some about, um, you know, what how people might approach this and, and ways to sort of think through this issue. Well, you know, I think one of the things, and this applies K through 12 through college and all, that we have to lead with, especially because the environment is so politicized and history and facts are so politicized, uh, is you gotta lead with primary sources. As an African-American teaching at a place like Ohio State where I get kids from uh, rural communities, from white kids from rural communities, suburban communities, you know, who've never had an African-American person as a teacher, uh, never had an African American in a position of authority. They're coming in skeptical. They're coming in doubting, right? Even some consciously, some unconsciously. And so, for the first couple of classes, it was like I, I almost say nothing, right? I'm like, hey, I gotta let the I gotta let the evidence speak for itself, right? Like, I, I can't tell you, you know, about I'm, I'm not gonna say anything about Thomas Jefferson. I'm not gonna comment. I just need you to read this. This is what Thomas Jefferson said, right? And and then suddenly, you know, they're like, wait a minute, maybe this guy has something to say. Right. You know, I mean, so so one of the things I mean, of, of the many I think that we can do as educators is find the primary sources and let the primary sources speak for themselves and then build the context around them. Because the kids have to I mean, they, they, they still understand evidence and sources, but they're just not dealing with them. So provide them with evidence, let them lead with the sources, then help that analysis. And then they'll open the minds then they'll open the ears then they'll open the eyes. I think the primary sources are really important. I agree with Hassan, and I also think about something that Candace said, because this happens at university as well, where we've got parents and um, people on social media attacking professors and accusing professors of having an agenda for both K through 12 and for university. You know, some 
uh, faculty members feel a deep responsibility to go in and comment on a new cycle. For me, for particularly for K through 12 educators, my argument is that you can follow this idea of teaching by proxy and commenting by proximity, along with the use of primary sources that puts you in a space to demonstrate that you're teaching critical thinking, demonstrate that you're not deviating from the curriculum, but you're helping students understand how um, the implications of one historical moment speak to what we're looking at in our contemporary moment. So after January 6th, uh, I'm not gonna go in and talk about January 6th directly. I'm gonna go in and talk about Little Rock, 1957. I'm going to talk about the response of the Eisenhower administration to what went down in Arkansas as a way to get students to organically make the connection. Hey, this seems a lot like that. And then we're having a conversation about, well, what did Eisenhower do in that moment? What did Oral Falbus do in that moment? What was the response to the African-American community um, consistent with Candace's work? Where are African-American women in that conversation? So what's Daisy Bates's position? How are young people responding? Uh, Sari and I did a, a, a unit together last year in the aftermath of George Floyd, and we were looking at Melba Patilla Beals, the youngest of Little Rock Nine, and her response in that moment where she writes in her diary, um, is it that nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? Even in the generosity of Melba Patilla Beals' language is an invitation for young people to ask a question in their contemporary moment, is it nobody cares or nobody knows what to do? And there are abundant examples in our history. If, as Sasan said, you're creative enough to think about how you wanna make those connections to really teach by proxy, comment by proximity. And if you get those angry letters, which we all have, you know, it's not wokeism that I'm practicing in the classroom. This is just good critical thinking, the foundations of what it means to get young people to that next level in terms of being able to interrogate the mean or interrogate meaning. Right, and that's exactly, I, I'm te I teach at the high school level, that's exactly what I do. Now, if kids walk away thinking that my class is political, that's because they're reading primary, secondary, and tertiary, most, they're reading primary sources, they're reading their textbook, their tertiary source, they're reading secondary sources, and that's providing the blueprint to the truth that we're all trying to teach, the facts, right? And so, it, yeah, I guess it becomes political when you start seeing the truth about American history, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. And I said this, I've said this many times. My students don't leave my class and they can they can chime in and tell me otherwise. They never, they, yeah, there are days when they leave class and say, wow, that was heavy. I never realized that. Because they're reading a primary source from like Frederick Douglass about what's the slave is the 4th of July. Yeah, they're not gonna walk out of class saying, go America. However, I will say that by the end of the school year, they don't leave my class hating America because they learn the truth. In fact, they, they, they leave the class uh, I think appreciating America more, and maybe they're not idealizing it as much as if they were at a class years ago when they weren't learning all the facts and the truth, but I do think they walk away from it feeling empowered, activated, and, and still proud to be an American. So I wanna debunk that ongoing trope that like, I'm history teachers teaching the truth or making people hate America. No, we're making people actually love America and try to make it a better place. I'm going to uh, piggyback off of what Sarah, Sarah said and, um, you know, mentioned that I think what a lot of students walk away from these experiences with is that the, you know, the idea that the American project is a continuing project. Um, and so there's a mystified, I think, from thinking that, uh, you know, everything is great and perfect and we've been on this forward trajectory throughout, throughout the entire uh, entirety of American history. Um, but I think, it, you know, instead they do learn that they still have a role to play, right, in making a America a better place. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, um, I think for teachers on all levels, one of the things that you can do is really get to know local history uh, and bring those local stories into the classroom. Um, a lot of students may have heard of someone like Frederick Douglass, but they might not know that there are people in their own state, right, who, who made really significant contributions um, and I think particularly if you're at a university where you have a lot of um, students who are who are from the local area, bringing in those stories can be really powerful. Um, and you'll find that like students sometimes have connections to those stories, like actual familial connections or they're like, I'm from that hometown, you know, my family's from there. Um, and I think that kind of helps make make things a little bit more real for a lot of students. Uh, and of course, you know, you'll be able to bring in those primary sources as well as other people already mentioned. 
just a quick addition to that too, is that when we think about that whole notion of kind of uh, teaching by proxy, this summer, for example, there was all this hullabaloo over um, the flights to um, the moon, or at least, you know, breaking and getting into orbit. So I'm walking in the first day of class and all these things are happening. I'm thinking about how to anchor this semester. Last year, we were blessed because Congressman John Lewis passed and wrote this wonderful letter to the American people that began with this call for our all, all of our collective need to understand history, right? And to understand the global enterprise and that we've been here before. So that's an invitation. But this year for me, you know, I want to begin with this question of the moon, right? And then that gives me the perfect segue to bring in Gil Scott Heron from 1969, Whitey on the Moon. You know, who are those people that are left behind? We're still talking about the enormous cost associated with this. We're talking about Gil Scott Heron in 1969, commenting on the extraordinary amounts of money that were being spent to help achieve Kennedy's vision of, you know, the Rice uh, speech, you know, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And then Gil Scott Heron saying, but what about down here? We could talk about that in the context of uh, the continuing crisis in Afghanistan in this contemporary moment. And what we have Malcolm X and Martin Luther King saying in that moment, Martin Luther King at Jimmy Lee Jackson's um, uh, eulogy um, in 1965 during the Selma campaign. How is it that the federal government can spend millions of dollars a day to put troops in South Viet Vietnam and can't protect the rights of its own citizens to vote at home? I'm only complicating questions that young people have, as, as Hassan pointed out, about voter suppression today and why we haven't conquered those in a way that are meaningful. And so then all these great stories, the local, like Candace talks about, like a Ruby Bridges, if you're from New Orleans, or talking about this and looking at the context of a Francis Nelly Griswold here in Minnesota, um, help to connect it in a very tangible way for people to say, this isn't just something that's happening now. This is a, is a deeper history and more importantly, it gets back to Hassan's point and Sari's point about activating young people because it's a reminder in a very tangible way. Candace's work speaks to it. What she talked about speaks to it, that you have a responsibility to act once you know that history. And here's a range of people at the local level who did that work. You don't know their names, but we live in a very different society because of the commitments they made in their moment um, toward social justice, toward equity, uh, toward equality. So you, you've all listed sort of a, a, a number of different kinds of uh, sources and, and people and events that we could talk about. Are, are there others that, uh, that you think are especially resonant with, uh, you know, especially maybe a, a younger audience, uh, you know, who, who uh, the, and, you know, we're talking, of course, if, if you're uh, have sort of range of syllabus things you could be talking about, uh, you know, but certainly if you're, you're teaching elementary school social studies or something, you know, you might, you might have a range of different things that you could bring in. So, uh, you know, are there particular, in addition to finding sort of the, the local uh, hook on that, uh, other things that, you know, uh, particular uh, events or people that you've taught about that always resonate, that, that always sort of get students excited well, I'll begin. I think, of course, everything is um, age appropriate, uh, obviously, uh, but there's some things that, that really can transcend um, age when we're thinking about the classroom. Um, when we're talking about the institution of slavery, I think uh, ads of freedom seekers, fugitive slaves, as we commonly call them, there's a, a, dot, a website, Freedom on the Move, um, that is a, a database, um, a sort of real time, um, database that's being built uh, out of Cornell that is terrific and wonderful because here you have these advertisements um, with information about the enslaved that are designed uh, for recapture, uh, but that describe, you know, in, accidentally, if you will, as a, as a part of the process of needing for recapture, the lives of enslaved folk. I mean, and these, you know, you can connect to local communities where people are coming, where they are, uh, where they're going. You know, who's putting out the ads? You know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. I mean, so there's so much there. And then you can connect them. Uh, and, 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 you know, this is, you know, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. There's no reason. I mean, the language is very clear, right? I mean, it, but you can uh, you can have really rich conversations as points of entry uh, for that and do projects around them. I and mean, there's some wonderful things that you can do. I mean, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the creative things that you can do there. I, I would also add that, you know, picture books, especially for elementary uh, students and, and, and younger, right? Kind kindergarten kids are, are wonderful um, sort of points of entry to these conversations. But now when we think about the context that we're in, uh, there's a parent group out of Tennessee that has identified um, the picture book authored by Ruby Bridges, 
uh, talking, you recall the name earlier, talking about her efforts as a child, as a six-year-old to desegregate uh, schools in New Orleans, uh, famously uh, captured by the Norman Rockwell, Rockwell painting. And, and they objected to it, you know, for elementary school because of the depiction in their terms, the depiction of the white mom, white people in it, right? Jeering at this black child. Uh, and it's like, well, what the hell did you want them to do, right? I mean, in terms of the depiction of this is the reality, the truth that people don't want, uh, uh, um, you know, our, our children to learn about. But that is a wonderful point of entry to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why are these parents yelling at this child? Why are they trying to keep her from going to school? And then what is the, how does that story play out? Um, so I think picture books and of course, you know, access to these uh, freedom on the move primary sources for that era are really, are really can be really helpful. I'm going to try to be really quick with this one because I, you know, I love everything that Hassan suggested. I wish Candace's book was out this year because given what teachers are facing, that's what I'd be leading with this year. I'd go in and say, hey, look, we're going to talk about um, activism among African-American female educators and understand this in the context of our contemporary moment where educators are now. And again, it's a teach by proxy, but I, I want to go back to something Hassan said that I think is very important. And that's this idea that you really can um, animate these conversations by comparison. Uh, something I see Siri do very effectively a lot of times. I'm going to put that Ruby Bridges picture up that uh, people have obje objected to so strenuously in Tennessee, and I'm going to put that up against Ru uh, Rockwell's Four Freedoms which is universally used in textbooks to communicate American values during the Second World War. And I'm gonna ask the question, who's absent in the Four Freedoms and who's animated and angry in that picture from Ruby Bridges? Because uh, Norman Rockwell captures that, not intentionally, but it speaks volumes about who mattered and who didn't matter in these contemporary moments. Political cartoons are phenomenal resources for that. And I also wanna make a plug for secondary sources. I know that in, at the university, we do this and it's kind of part of what we do. But I would encourage teachers, We're doing. Uh, Michael Long and I just completed a, a new biography of Jackie Robinson called Jack, why? Because Jackie is an invention of the American media and an invention of a moment that had to pre uh, present this kind of sanitized black man who actually as an individual uh, took positions on politics. And so we wanna kind of do that revision. But at the same time, a book like Bloody Lounge that Hassan is responsible for, where he talks about big concepts like freedom politics, Go in the first day, put the preamble up and say, we're going to interrogate what citizenship has meant over the years. And whenever we come to a question in this semester about um, we the people, what has that meant in 1789? What did that mean in 1830? What did that mean in 1865? Again, something I've seen Sari do on many occasions. We're going to interrogate that. Or I'm going to go in. Um, I call them the six degrees of segregation. I love Hassan's framework of freedom politics. What does freedom politics me meant? for people over uh, years. And it gives you the entree into those local individuals uh, that Candace was talking about, where you can look at the national and you can and be talking about someone like a Frederick Douglass, but you can translate those freedom politics on the ground for what this looked like in Broward County, Florida, what this looked like in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, what this looked like in Lowndes County and what happens when it migrates to Chicago. Those are powerful stories. I could fill up days and days with anecdotes and examples, but I'm going to come, I'm going to just give two examples that I, that popped into mind that resonate the most of my students through the years. Hassan brought up, Dr. Jeffries brought up Thomas Jefferson. You don't have to say anything about Thomas Jefferson. Give them Benjamin Banneker's letter to Thomas Jefferson and his response, and then ask the kids what they think. If, the, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not even going to tell the audience what I'm talking. Read Benjamin Banneker's, Banneker's letter. It's quite long. Thomas Jefferson's response is quite short and the content of it speaks volumes. The other, the other story that I've, the other person I've been highlighting a lot more in my classes, even though she might not necessarily be listed in depth on, on high school curriculum, curricula, it, but she should be, Ida B. Wells. She, I mean, we all know about her, but the fact that Kids come every time they learn her story. I mean, she plays a pivotal role in so many aspects of American life. The the women's suffrage movement, anti-lynching, list goes on and on. I can't tell you how many, especially young women in my class say, wow, I, I'm so inspired learning about her. I, I didn't learn about her before. And I could go on and on. But those are just two that has popped into mind. And again, I'm not telling, I'm showing, I'm giving them primary sources, I'm giving them secondary sources, historians writing about these people, and then I'm asking them to discuss and tell me their response. 
And that's the, and they can learn the story of structural racism without me even saying what it is by just reading those sources. I'm just going to give two plugs, you know, as much as we want our students to consistently read, sometimes they don't. Um, so, you know, like some good brain breaks to build into your curriculum. I love using podcasts. Um, so many of them actually include the actual actors um, from our historical past. Uh, and of course, um, there are some really good documentaries out there. So, you know, as much as we uh, want to rely on primary sources, there, you know, there are all sorts of like, um, Dr. Williams mentioned so many good secondary sources out there as well. And Candace, plug your own article too. <laughs> um, my article um, that was published this year in History of Education, um, and it is um, publicly available, so you don't have to have a subscription to get it. Uh, it's called Hell is Popping here in South Carolina, Orangeburg County, Black Teachers in the yes. post-Brown era. It's a it's a terrific article, uh, and it was the the basis for the podcast episode that that Candace and I did, uh, and which I will say is uh, the most popular episode I have done of Unsung History. People love it, so uh, and I think the the article too is it's very readable, and I think you know very accessible for people. So uh, we have about uh, fourteen minutes left, and I want to devote that to what people should do action items. Uh, so uh, we've, we've gotten a comment uh, on YouTube, uh, someone asking uh, in embattled local school districts, what should people do? How should they approach this? So I want to sort of talk about um, action, both in sort of a, a you know, a, a big sense, uh, you know, what should we be doing as a political response, as Hassan mentioned earlier, uh, but then also if you're in one of these locales uh, where, you know, things are, are really tough on the ground, what people should do. Uh, so maybe we can start with sort of the the political response, the, you know, sort of what to do about these state legislatures attempting to pass or passing legislation. Uh, so I, I, I will say uh, to start, uh, you know, this is something I think a lot about with Two Broads Talking Politics. We're always talking about state politics and how deeply important uh, you may not know who your state legislator is. You probably know your senator, maybe you know your congressman. You probably don't know your state legislator. Uh, and you should. And this is why you should, because you need to develop a relationship with these people. They need to hear from you. Uh, and and often they're they're fairly uh, approachable and accessible. Um, because they, you know, they they don't have maybe the large staff and the large budget that a, that a, a, a congressional office might have, uh, and and you can find them. Uh, you know, I I can walk down the street sometimes and see my state representative, uh, and and we need to tell them we need to be vocal um, because it is it is obvious that the the sort of anti CRT anti truth crowd is vocal. This is coordinated. They are showing up places. They are making noise. They are writing letters to the editor. Uh, and so we need to do the same thing in response. And I think I think part of that response, you're absolutely right, uh, Kelly. We have to, in a state like Ohio, where you have bills that are working away, two bills, insidious bills that, you know, just uh, about parroting the other bills that we've seen in Idaho and these other places. Um, you know, a lot of these state legislators are just signing on, particularly on the Republican side, they're just signing on to it. Uh, a number of Democratic legislators, you know, aren't really paying that much attention or don't have the um, the talking points in the response because all oh, this is just driven by talking points. Um, and then local boards of education are just being inundated. They're just like, whoa, what's happening here, right? Because of this organized coordinated response, right? And, it, and it's not a majority of people, it's just some very loud voices. And so I think a couple things need to happen. One, we absolutely need to reach out in those states that haven't already passed these bills, may have bills coming up, or even those uh, who haven't seen bills yet introduced, um, they have to reach out to their state legislators and say, don't do it, right? And, and, and be clear about it. I mean, we need to be thinking about in organized ways, and I know there's some different organizations that are saying, we need our own talking points, right? Like one, this stuff isn't true. Nobody, this isn't about Marxist indoctrination. You know, this, is, this isn't about teaching kids to hate America. I mean, all of those responses need to be in there and our legislators, legislators need to understand that so they can respond adequately. But we also have to reach out to our state boards of education, our local boards of education and school boards and tell them don't cave because they know what's not being taught in the classroom, 
right? But to, to just but just to get these folk off their back in many ways, they're like, all right, fine, we'll we'll make sure that this is no, no, no. They cannot cave because that is a slippery slope that we're already sliding down, and it will lead to the silencing of teachers uh, and the and the silencing of the teaching of truth in the classroom. So I think we absolutely need to be mobilizing and organizing um, campaigns, contact campaigns in whatever way, and even showing up at these school boards saying, you know what, they are not the majority at all. Uh, most parents do want this, but a lot of them are scared because they don't know. So part of that has to be education, but we absolutely have to be reaching out to those political entities that have decision-making power and authority right now. I, I would say if you don't know who your state legislator is uh, or legislators are and you don't know how to find out that information, please uh, feel free to email me. Uh, so just two broads talking politics at gmail.com. Uh, I've spent a lot of time over the past four years on uh, state legislature websites and, and know a lot about how to track down that. Uh, and I'm very happy to to help you do that research and, and uh, you know, connect you with those people. Uh, so I, I think that's important. Uh, I'd follow up on, on what Hassan just said, too. Uh, so this is not a, a short term answer. This is a longer term answer. Um, but you should also run for school board. You know, if these are things that are important to you, uh, that you want to make sure that school boards are are uh, standing up for the truth uh, in Nearly all places, uh, except Chicago, where I live, the school board is elected. Uh, you can run. This is Im really important. And there are organizations out there that will help you in your run for school board. I'm happy to help connect you with them. Uh, and it's important who's on a school board, not just for what happens in schools, but because school board is often a stepping stone. So those same people who are on school boards are then going to run for state legislatures or then going to run for Congress. And we want to make sure the right people are in those positions uh, and are, are taking those steps and don't want to provide a springboard for people who want to shut down the truth. I wanted to add just very quickly to that, I think, um, and I put a link to Candace's article for those of you that are following on Twitter, please check. It is actually phenomenal. Um, but it, again, reminds me of some of my own work on Alice Dunbar Nelson, who stood up for an African-American man who was being executed by the state of Delaware uh, in 1930 for a crime he did not commit. And her argument in her private correspondence to other reformers in that moment was that the young people are watching. Um, I would say to parents in this moment in particular, not necessarily educators, because we fight this battle in different spaces, three things. Number one, um, don't normalize this. So you, you've got to speak out and speak out consistently on it in the circles where you have influence. Don't avoid that conversation um, at Sunday dinner because you don't want to make people uncomfortable. We have to have that conversation. It's a small part that you can play. Number two, because young people are, walking, are watching, don't do like Representative Tom Immer did. I was just on a local news broadcast with him. We're both on a radio program. And it's clear that his talking points are coming from a nationally syndicated uh, television network. And so know the other side, understand what those arguments are, because the reality is they're not reading the materials that they're quoting. They're not familiar with the research associated with the theories that they're seeking to challenge. And quite frankly, many of them are operating on a model of US history um, that's more consistent with what they learned in the late 70s and early 80s, as opposed to what has been the standard, as Sari can speak to, in um, uh, at least high school education for the last 15, 20 years. So this is just ridiculous. And then last but not least, everybody has a role to play. So think about that layered approach. Um, I love uh, one of the things that I, I've seen Sari do very consistently, which is that if you're in a space where you believe that you have an element or a layer of protection, then be vocal in the way that you speak out. But if you're in a space where um, you are feeling uh, put upon, so on and so forth, let people know so they can amplify that nationally because the more that we can share these stories, the more that we can show that this isn't just wounds producing narratives, these are wounds and there's real damage being done um, to the profession, to what we hopefully are able to, you know, again, we're the caretakers of American democracy and informed uh, public is central to the way even conservatives should understand this. Um, and I'm not saying that in a way to be pejorative against conservatives, but those who make the case that, you know, you need an informed electorate, well, then burning books or banning theories or going after educators is not the way to do that. The way to, pro uh, to produce that is to create a conduit for unfettered communication and, and conversation around issues of, of equity and justice that are central to American democratic practice. 
I agree with what everyone said. In particular, the the idea that we need to really work harder and smarter at building a community to protect teachers. And it can't we can't just rely on people in this space of education to do that. This is not just and just be and right now they're acting up about masks at these school board meetings, but don't get don't get distracted by that. They are going this is a continuing attack. It's going to continue. And so we need, we can't sleep on it. We can't say, oh, well, I haven't heard about this as much recently in the past couple of weeks because it's still there. These bills are on the table. There's more being written up. They're inspired by the former guy's 1776 commission. You're right. They're cookie cutters from that. I remember reading that and just saying, wow, I'm glad this guy's leaving because this is terrifying. And now they've just reared their ugly head in these, in these state bills and vague, but very specific and clear what they don't want us to teach. And I agree. I mean, I have been vocal about it. I've been, I got to, I got a taste of the ugliness from the right wing when you do speak out. And I wasn't even being that controversial in a tweet. And I got, I was under assault and I said, bring it on because I know that my union has my back. I know that my, my I work at a school that's dedicated to anti-racist education. So I'm just putting into practice in the public sphere. So I'm fine doing it. So I do have people who come to me and share little tidbits about their districts and, and I'm happy to be vocal about it, but you know, if you want to help out, you can too. You don't have to be uh, an outspoken teacher like me or an outspoken professor. Uh, you can you can lean on others, and I agree with Dr. Williams on that. And but even if you don't work in education, don't sit this one out because this is an attack on the truth, and this is attack on the America we want to continue and the America we love. So please, please, please help us teach the truth by supporting us in any way you can. And I'll just add to, to that last point. When you look at a number of these bills, they also apply not just to K through 12 and through colleges and universities. Uh, the Ohio bill, for example, uh, applies to all state agencies. Um, and specifically, you know, you can't teach these divisive issues. You can't infringe upon uh, sort of can do this indoctrination stuff. What they're talking about is no diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism trainings, right? Um, but they also apply, they would also apply to contractors with the state that the, if they are found to be doing this, they can lose their contract. So this isn't just about what's in the classroom. Certainly that is the focal point, but this is tentacles that reach far and wide and, and it really can touch so many other aspects of our lives. Yeah, thanks for saying that because I see a lot of the, the talk you see on this is, it stems from, oh, they were doing a diversity training at my corporate job, and that made me uncom uncomfortable. So you're right. It's important to keep in mind that just because you're not in a school, that doesn't mean that they're not attacking diversity training and anti-racism on that level. Uh, very quickly, just to add to both those points, too, don't fall for the argument about equal time. This is not about equal time. Um, this is not a television a news program with curated positions um, meant to reflect um, the left, the right, and someone in the middle. These are conversations about American history. Again, um, I, I would commend people to uh, follow Hassan, um, not just the podcast, but pick up the work that he's done on pedagogy. If you're a teacher, if you're kind of thinking about how do I tackle some of these issues, look at the phenomenal work that was done on Monticello. Um, this isn't about equal time. This isn't about talking about the merits of Jefferson. This is talking about the institution of slavery and how it influenced America socially, politically, economically, and culturally. So it's a very different conversation. We can't allow our, our this conversation, as Sari pointed out, you can't sit this one out. Don't allow this to be dominated by forces that um, are anathema to the cornerstones and foundations of what we associate with good, um, rigorous uh, educational practice. And, and I, um, I'm sorry, no, I, don't wanna, I don't want to sound, you know, overly reactionary, but I do want to um, reiterate that public education as a whole has been under attack for a very long time. Um, and there are people who would like for there to not be um, a, a public education system. And um, I think that's part, that's part of what's happening now. You know, public education is why someone like my mother who grew up poor and black and rural Jim Crow South, right, was able to go to college and go to medical school, right, and, and, and make a life for herself. Um, and she was able to do that with education that was incredibly flawed, right? Um, and so 
you know, when we talk about what's happening right now, I, you know, I just want to remind people that this is part of a much bigger picture, right? It's not just this one moment, it's part of our past and it's going to continue to be part of our future. Um, and so on kind of like a local level, one of the things you can do, it sounds very simple, but if you know a teacher, ask how you can help, ask how you can help her. You know, it might be something as simple as buying her some mask <laughs> if we're talking about that, um, but ask how you can help her. Um, and I think you'll find that you can, you can then kind of make your way to making bigger steps to be helpful. Yeah. And I'd say uh, to my fellow white parents, this is a moment that we need to step up. Uh, and so white parents are the ones arguing uh, that we should get rid of this teaching uh, and white parents need to be uh, standing up, fighting back. We need to be loud in school board meetings. We have that privilege. We can't make, uh, you know, parents of color be the ones doing all of this work. This this has to be something that we're doing. Uh, so I, I, we are at uh, at time now, so I'm, I'm going to start to to wrap this up. Uh, we have talked about a number of really uh, important sources and resources here. So I am going to, over the next few days, add those to the Two Broads Talking Politics website. So you can check back there where this event is posted uh, with a, a list of these, these resources and things that we have talked about here. Uh, I would also encourage you, if you are a teacher, and feel comfortable doing so to sign the Teach Truth Pledge uh, at Zen Education Project. Uh, it is a public pledge, so be aware of that. If uh, if you are not comfortable doing that, if you think your own job might be in danger, uh, but if if you do have the productions to do that, uh, like Sari was talking about, please do so that we can show that there are large numbers of teachers in this country who do pledge to to teach the truth. Uh, so. Uh, Huge thank you to my panel. This was incredible. I am so glad that that you agreed to to join on and do this. Does anyone have any sort of parting thoughts or comments that you want to share? You know, I, I would just say, building off what what has already been said and, and drawing off of the what I've learned from the civil rights movement, that um, everybody can do something. Everybody should do something. Everybody needs to do something, but everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. Uh, and so uh, you know, the, the responses have to be situational because we need you in the classroom. Uh, and so understand and survey the political terrain. There is something that you can do. There's something that everybody can do, uh, but make wise decisions and wise choices, understanding the situation and context that you're in and find that support, build that support, but make sure you do something. That's great. And I think that is a great way to close. Uh, so uh, thank you to everyone who has been uh, watching. And you know this will continue to be available on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. So please share widely if there are people that you think would benefit from it. So thank you.